time to start a new unit in this course, and this unit may seem very unlike the things we've been doing so far, at least at first, but there will be hints here and there of some calculus that we're familiar with as we go through this unit. But fair warning, at first it's going to seem very different and it's not going to be evident immediately why we're doing this work. But at the end of this unit, we're going to get to one big application to stuff we're a little bit more familiar with that will use this material on what we call infinite sequences and series. So at first it's going to seem kind of unusual and kind of outside of the uh, normal material we've been covering this semester, but it turns out there are some fundamental ties back to the things that we've been talking about. But here at the end of this calculus course, the typical end to the course is to cover these infinite sequences and series. And again, as I say, we'll see a little bit later why we're interested in them and why they're so useful. So at first, we'll start just talking about what they are, how they work, and a few other topics before we see why they're useful. But there are all sorts of applications for especially infinite series. If you uh, study physics and you run across something called Fourier series, those are an example of one of these applications. There are many others. We'll touch on one again near the end of this unit. So very simply as we start out, I want to just give you a quick description of these terms. These are not formal definitions or anything, but simply just a quick summary so that you can keep track of what we mean when we use the term sequence or the term series. A sequence is simply an ordered list of values. You can have a finite sequence, you can have an infinite sequence. Of course, being a calculus class, the infinite is more interesting to us, so we're going to deal with infinite sequences. You may, for instance, have heard of the Fibonacci sequence. That's an infinite sequence. There's a pattern that continues on and on and on. And then if we use the term series, that's what we get if we start with an infinite sequence and then we add up all of the terms. So if we took each term in the sequence and started adding them together, that would give us a series. And I want to point out that our textbook makes a distinction between the term series and the term sum. They use the term sum to mean a finite sum, like a finite series. And then they reserve the word series for an infinite series. Not everyone does this, but just keep that in mind that in our textbook or homework, if you run across the term sum versus series and it's making a distinction, the distinction is simply that a sum is finite and a series is infinite. You can think about, for instance, the Riemann sum that we've used before, and that's generally a finite sum with a large number of values, but not necessarily infinite. And then when we take the limit and we think about making that infinite, you could think about transforming it into a series in that case. So there's a little subtle distinction there, and it's not crucial, but you may just want to watch out for that as you read the textbook or do the homework. So as we start our study here of infinite sequences and infinite series, I want to start with a little story. And you may have heard of this before. It's called Zeno's Paradox. Zeno was a Greek mathematician and philosopher, more of a philosopher than anything. And he stated a paradox, and there are many forms that this paradox takes, but one of them goes something like this. If you want to travel from point A to point B, we have a certain distance that we'd like to travel. In order to do that, you first have to cover half of the distance. So now we get to this intermediate point halfway there. And now we have to travel from this point to point B. So we still have to cover half of that distance. So now we have to cover half of the remaining distance which turns out to be a quarter of the full distance from point A to point B. And then, now we have a shorter distance to travel, but each time we pause after one of these half distance sprints, then we still have some finite distance to cover, 
and we still have to cover half of the distance. So no matter how far we go, as we zoom in further and further, there's always going to be some finite distance left to travel. So how on earth can we ever get from point A to point B? And so based on this paradox, Zeno said something like, therefore movement is impossible. Which of course is not true, so this is why it's a paradox, that it's seemingly contradictory with what we know just from experience. So how do we resolve this? How do we think about adding up all of these half distances? It looks something like this mathematically. If we have some distance to travel, and let's call it one mile, for instance, we'd have to add up half of a mile and then half of the remaining distance, which would be one quarter, and then half of the remaining distance, which would be one eighth, and each time it goes down by a power of two, and so on, and you can keep doing this forever, this series will go on forever. These terms will get very, very small, but there will always be some finite distance. No matter where you stop, it'll always be a finite distance from one. And yet, if were to resolve this, if this is going to make any sense at all with reality, when we add all these up, we must be able to add up an infinite list of numbers and get an answer of one at the end. And this is where things seem strange and unlike our experience because we naturally think if we're going to add up an infinite list of numbers, how on earth could this sum, this result after adding up infinitely many numbers, how could that be finite? And yet it turns out to be true. And the reason it works is because these terms are getting so small so quickly. So you can actually think back to when we talked about improper integrals. And it turns out that what we did with improper integrals is closely tied to this idea where we integrated something like one over X squared from one to infinity we had an infinite interval, and yet the area underneath that curve turned out to be finite. And so these paradoxes, these unusual conclusions that deal with the infinite, these are tightly wrapped together with concepts we've seen before. But it's something we have to kind of get used to and be ready to handle as we see different examples. So we can actually verify this using a calculator it doesn't prove anything for us, but at least it will help us gain confidence that this is true. So if we check this on a calculator and start adding together subsequent terms, we can kind of see how this works. Let me show you that. If we add one half plus one fourth, we get 0.75. And then if we add one eighth to that, we get 0.875 plus 1 16th plus 1 over 32. And it takes a little while, but before long we start to notice something interesting. That even though we're adding something positive, we're never going to pass 1. Our answers are never going to go above 1. They just get closer and closer to it because the amount that we add each time is less than the remaining distance to one. And so we can keep doing this forever and we'll just get closer and closer and closer to one. Really looking an awful lot like a limit that we saw all the way back in Calc 1. And you can keep doing this and you'll never pass one. You'll just get closer and closer and closer to it. So the idea of limits is also tightly bound up with this idea of infinite series. Because one way to think about an infinite series like this is to imagine taking sums like this where we add the first two terms and then we add the third term and the fourth term and the fifth term like we're doing here and we observe what happens to those answers and we think of a limit and what it approaches. So that's one useful idea and we'll actually return to this in a few minutes and come back to a slightly more rigorous proof that this series does converge to one. That's our first
use of that word, a convergent series. But we use that term with improper integrals as well, where we talked about convergent and divergent integrals. And with infinite series, the main question is going to be, is it convergent? In other words, does the sum equal a finite value? Or is it divergent? Do the terms add up and continue increasing up to infinity? So let me write this series down a little bit more compactly. If I write something like 1 over 2 to the k, that's the general form of the terms of this series. Right? These are all powers of 2 in the denominator. We have 1 over 2 to the first power, then 1 over 2 to the second power, 1 over 2 to the third power, and the fourth power, and so on. So that's a stand-in for the general form of the term of each series. And then if we add those up, so we use this summation notation, and I'm going to start with k equals 1 and go to infinity. So this right here is another way of representing this series right here, but it's much more compact. And so we'll use this notation commonly going forward where we'll write down a formula that gives us the form of the terms of the series. So notice that k starts at 1 because the first term is 1 half. If the series started with 1 fourth plus 1 eighth and so on, we could have k starting at 2 and we can adjust as needed. So this series is what we call a convergent infinite series. And the term convergent simply means that if you sum these terms, you get a finite value at the end. Divergent would be one that the sum is infinite. Let me give you another example. Let's take, say we take a simple series, 1 over k. So when k equals 1, that would be 1 over 1. When k equals 2, that would be 1 half. When k equals 3, that would be 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, etc. And at first, this one looks an awful lot like the one we just looked at. This one also has terms that are getting smaller because the denominators are getting larger, so the entire fractions are getting smaller as you go further down the series. So you may think, just in the same way that the series we did earlier, when you add up those terms, it's going to converge to something. You may see here as well, if we add these terms up, they should converge to something because they're getting smaller pretty quickly. But let's check that out. Let's do it the same way that we did the previous one using the calculator. So we'll add one plus a half, and then add one third to that and then one-fourth. So notice how we've passed one, we've passed two. So let's see if it ever settles down to anything. If we keep adding values here, it starts to slow down. So maybe two and a half will be where it stops. Nope, it passed two and a half. So let's keep going. Maybe it'll stop before three. Still hasn't passed three. Oops, there it passed three. So no matter where we think it's going to stop, it turns out that if you add enough terms here, it'll keep on going. And it takes a little while, but no matter what boundary you set where you think it might stop, it always will end up passing that. So in this case, the terms are getting smaller but they're not getting smaller fast enough. And so they keep breaking through each limit that you expect to be able to set. So it turns out, and we'll prove this a little bit more rigorously in a minute, that this series is divergent, that it adds up to infinity. So this one is divergent. And again, the big question with infinite series in this unit is going to be, is it convergent or is it divergent? And we'll have tests that will tell us whether a particular series converges or whether it diverges.
And if we can, it's always nice when we can find out what a convergent series converges to. Like with the first example, we know that it adds up to equal one. There are times that we can find what it converges to, but there are plenty of times where we can't find out what it actually converges to. We simply have an answer that yes, we know it converges, and that's good enough in many cases. I mentioned at the beginning that we're gonna have a big application at the end of this unit, and convergence is crucial to that application because it's only useful when things converge and not when they diverge. So these two series are good starting examples to give us a sense of what we might run across. This second one in particular is an important one to recognize. This example is called the harmonic series. And it's a crucial example because it's one that we can compare a lot of things to. So keep this one in mind, memorize the harmonic series. That's simply the one where you have one over K, it's just one plus one half plus one third and so on. This name harmonic series, we won't take the time to go into it, but if you look that up, it basically has to do with wave harmonics. If you, for instance, take a guitar string and pluck the string, it starts to vibrate. And the way that it vibrates, if you study that, you'll find these fractions showing up with basically the number of nodes that that vibration has and the shape of that vibration curve, you'll see these harmonics start to appear. And so that term harmonic series comes from that. So again, if you're interested in that and you're musically oriented, you can look that up and it might be interesting to you to see more on the harmonic series. But for now, we'll just keep that term in mind. The harmonic series is that specific series and it's a good one to compare things to. Okay, so in general, a sequence, just as a reminder, is just a list of numbers in order. So something like one half, one fourth, one eighth, etc. Just this list would be a sequence. It would become a series if we add them together. So there's a link between sequences and series. Each series has sort of an underlying sequence, the sequence of terms, and there are other connections between sequences and series, but it's important to keep the two terms distinct in your mind. That you understand when we say a sequence, we just mean a list of numbers. When we say a series, that's when we're adding them together. We're gonna to spend most of our time talking about series. We'll talk about sequences and do a couple of examples here in a second but just keep those terms distinct in your mind and make sure you don't mix them up. There is some notation to keep track of. With sequences, you might see something like this, where we use these curly braces, just like you would use for a set. It's kind of reusing that notation, but here it means a sequence, and you may see k equals one and infinity as the subscript and superscript just to indicate where the sequence starts and ends. You can also have finite sequences if this upper value were something other than infinity. And then for a series, we've already seen the notation here, something like this. Most of the series that we'll deal with in this unit will start with k equaling one but that's not a hard and fast rule. K can start at zero, it can start at two, it can start at negative five, it can start wherever you want. It's just that for consistency's sake, we generally start with K equals one and keep things fairly similar from one example to the next. So let me show you a couple of examples of sequences. For example, the sequence with the form 2k minus one. Here, if we don't include the k equals one subscript and infinity superscript, those are the default values. So if you don't have anything else there, we're going to assume that k starts at one and goes to infinity. 
you may have examples where those are explicitly stated or there may be ones where it's left off and that's the default assumption. So all you do is say when k equals one, what's two k minus one? Two times one minus one is one. And then bump k up to two and repeat. So when k equals two, you have two times two minus one, that's three. And then repeat and keep doing this and you notice that you're getting all odd values. One, three, five, seven, nine, etc. So very simple to take a formula like this, a pattern, and write out the terms of the sequence. Here's a slightly more complicated one, but the process remains the same. It's just a matter of keeping track of all of these different pieces. So here we have negative one to the power of k times k plus one divided by three to the power of k. With things like this, it might be helpful to do kind of one piece at a time. So let's take the denominator where we have three to the k. The first value when k equals one will be three. The next value will be nine, three squared. Then three to the third power is 27 then 81, then 243, and so on. Then if we look at the numerator, k plus one, when k equals one, that'll be two. When k equals two, that'll be three. When k equals three, that'll be four. And notice it's just going up by one each time. So it's helpful to notice these patterns. k plus one, every time k increases, it simply increases by one. If it were something like two k plus one, every time k increased, it would increase by two. And the plus one just sets the starting point. The multiple, the coefficient of k, tells you how much to increase each time. And then all we haven't used yet is the negative one to the k. When k is one, negative one to the first power is negative one negative one to the second power is positive one, negative one to the third power is negative one, and then notice this alternating pattern that all of the odd values of k end up being negative. All of the even values end up being positive. And so notice that alternating pattern that comes from the negative one to the k. So again, writing all these terms out given the formula isn't hard, but it's useful to think about breaking it down into those individual components of the formula and seeing how they build to the final version. We can work in reverse. If we start with a sequence where we have the terms listed out, something like this, we can recognize what the pattern would be. Now this one, again, we have a numerator and a denominator, so it's helpful to separate those two and look at each one at a time. The denominator looks just like the one we worked, so we know already that that's gonna be three to the k. We could change things up a little bit, and if we started with nine, for instance, then you could think about how that would change to three to the power of k plus one, or instead if it was powers of two or powers of four, how you would recognize that. So there are variations you can make, but we recognize that pattern of powers of three. And then in the numerator, we have five, 10, 15, 20. So since this increases by five every time, we know there must be a five times k, and it turns out that's all there is, because when k equals one, we would get five. When k equals two, we would get 10. When k equals three, we get 15 and so on just as the sequence is laid out. So there's our answer. This sequence can be written as 5k divided by three to the power of k. Here's a slightly more complicated one, just to see if you can do this. You may want to pause the video and see if you can work it out yourself before I show you the solution. But again, we're gonna break this down into individual pieces. So we have a numerator and a denominator, and then we also have an alternating positive negative sign. 
So first, let's focus on the denominator to start out with. We have 7, 11, 15, 19, 23. You should be able to see that the pattern is adding 4 each time. So if you're adding 4 each time, that means we must have a 4 times k, so that every time k increases by 1, that denominator increases by 4. And if we just had 4k, then it would need to start with 4, and then go to 8, and 12, and 16, and so on, which isn't what we have here. So we need to shift it, and if the first value is 7, then we need 4k plus 3, to make that first term be correct, and then the others all follow from that. Then for the numerator, we have 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25, and so on. You should recognize that those are the perfect squares. So we have 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, and 5 squared. So we're starting with k equals 1, so we can just use k squared instead of something like k plus 1 squared or anything. And then lastly, we have this alternating positive and negative. We used negative 1 to the k last time, but if we do that again, notice that the negative sign will be on the wrong terms. The first term, third term, and fifth term would be negative if it was just negative 1 to the k. So we need to shift it and make the second, fourth, sixth, and so on terms negative. So all we do there is we change that to a k plus 1. Or you could make it k minus 1 or k plus 3 or something like that, but k plus 1 is probably the simplest version. So negative 1 to the k makes the odd terms negative. Negative 1 to the k plus 1 makes the even terms negative, because whenever k is even, k plus 1 will be odd, and negative 1 to an odd power is negative. So as complicated as that starts out looking, if you break it down into a few simple pieces, it isn't too bad to write down the general form of the sequence. And this is a valuable tool when you're dealing with sequences and series in general. If you have them written out with a few terms that you can recognize a pattern, it's useful to be able to then write down the general structure of the formula. Okay, briefly before we wrap up here, let me go back to those two series we started with. So we'll go back to the series we got from Zeno's Paradox, that series with the powers of two. And the claim was that if we add up these terms here, that we would get one at the end of it. And we checked this with a calculator and sort of convinced ourselves that this makes sense, but it's not quite as valid of a proof as we would like. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take that process that we did on the calculator and actually write it down using fractions instead of decimals, and that will let us observe a pattern. So this process that I'm gonna show you here is not one that we're gonna do very often. This may be the only time you ever see it. So if it doesn't make a lot of sense, that's okay. But it's a useful tool every now and again when you are stuck on a series uh, to evaluate it this way and think about adding terms one by one. So what we're gonna start with is over here, we're gonna start adding pieces together. So we're gonna start with one half and then we'll add one-fourth to that, and then we'll add one-eighth to that. So every time we go down to the next line, we're simply adding another term to the series. Exactly what we did on the calculator. And then we'll keep track of the total over here on the right but it turns out that if we keep track of the total as a fraction, a pattern emerges. Again, we don't do this very often, largely because often the pattern isn't very obvious when you do this, but this one, the pattern ends up being pretty clear. So after the first term, we just have one half. If you add one half plus one fourth, you get three fourths. 
if you add one half plus one fourth plus one eighth, you get seven eighths. Then if you add one sixteenth to that, you get 15 sixteenths. If you add one more, you get 31 30 seconds, and so on. So notice what's happening here. And this kind of makes sense when you add one half plus one fourth, you're adding everything you need for one except another one fourth. So you have three fourths. When you add these three together, you're adding everything you need except one eighth. So your answer ends up being seven eighths, and so on. So notice the pattern here that emerges. These fractions, the denominators, are the powers of two. So we have one half, three fourths, seven eighths. So the powers of two are the denominators, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and they would continue from there. So we have two to the k in the denominator. Then the numerator each time is just one less than the denominator. We have one over two, three over four, seven over eight, 15 over 16, 31 over 32, each time the numerator is one less than the denominator. So each numerator is just two to the k minus one. Notice it's not two to the power of k minus one, it's two to the power of k, and then we subtract one from that. So this sequence we're looking at, the fancy term for this is called the sequence of partial sums. That's not necessarily a term you need to memorize, but if you ever run across the term sequence of partial sums, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a sequence of values that's the answer each time we stop taking the sum after two or three or four or five terms, and that sequence winds up having a pattern to it. So in essence, what we're looking for is the limit as k goes to infinity of this sequence of partial sums. Because as k goes to infinity, we're adding up further and further down this list, and we're seeing what happens. Now you can do a little algebra here and split this up as one minus one over two to the k. And of course, as k goes to infinity, one over two to the k goes to zero. So this winds up equaling one, which is exactly what we expected it to be but now we have a little bit more evidence to verify that. This is a little bit more rigorous than just using the calculator and recognizing that those numbers are getting closer and closer to one. So this is one approach, and it's not something we're gonna do again in any of these examples, but it's something I wanted you to see at least once, just to get a sense of, on a very basic level, what's one way we can check whether a series converges or diverges it really boils down to taking the calculator and adding terms more and more, but if you can write it using a limit like this, you can get a little bit more evidence to verify your claim. And then I'll show you briefly a similar concept with the harmonic series. So this is the other example that we've seen. And the claim here is that the series one over k, which we write as one plus one half plus one third and so on, diverges. In other words, when we add that up, we get an infinite answer. So the quote unquote proof for this, it's not really a proof, but the way we can check this a little bit more clearly than just using the calculator and watching it continually go up is something like this. This is also something we're not going to do again on other series, but it works for this one, and it's a kind of clever way to show that this works. So we can take one plus one half, and I'm just going to write out a few terms of this series, and you might notice something odd about the way that I write this out. I'm just visually clustering together some of these terms. Now, why have I done that? The reason I've done that is that I can now group these together and say each of these pieces is going to be at least as large as one half. So one is certainly larger than a half. 
one half is at least as large as a half. One third plus one fourth is larger than one fourth plus one fourth because one third is larger than one fourth. So one third plus one fourth is larger than one fourth plus one fourth, which is a half. So that's larger than a half. This one here, we have one fifth, one sixth, and one seventh, all of which are larger than an eighth. And then we're adding an eighth to that. So if we had four eighths together, we would have a half. We have something larger than a half. So all of these are greater than or equal to a half. And we can continue this on. We can always grab more terms and group them together and say this cluster is larger than or equal to a half. And all of them you can actually make larger than a half. So we're adding up something larger than one half over and over and over again. So clearly if we're taking a non-decreasing value like a half and we can write out this series as one half plus one half plus one half plus one half, that's clearly going to diverge because there's no chance of that decreasing value coming in handy. So um, this is not a super rigorous proof, but it's one way to gather the evidence that this series diverges. And it indeed does diverge. And we'll use that repeatedly in later series as we compare other things to this. So the harmonic series is an important one to keep in mind. Going forward, we're gonna talk about another category of series, which is very significant called the geometric series. That's a pattern, a form of a series that occurs fairly often. And we'll talk about how that one can be tested to see whether it converges or diverges.